So thanks for the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I have to admit, I have a soft spot for the Austro-Marxists. Uh, so I'll be happy to tell you a little bit about my thoughts about Rudolf Hilferding. Uh, however, in my presentation, uh, they will get a mixed press, uh, to put it that way. Uh, what I'll be looking at uh, is essentially the economic policy strategy uh, that social democrats had uh, in the interwar years. And uh, the, the, the reason why that is interesting or where that culminates is that uh, in uh, 1931, early 1932, when the uh, German economy was hit by the, the, what nowadays is known as the Great Depression. Uh, so we have a period of, of sharply rising unemployment. Uh, we have a financial crisis, the Dunard Bank, which was the third largest or second largest bank at the time goes bankrupt um, and uh, the, the, in a way the political situation heats up. Uh, in particular, the, the, the NSDAP is having the first uh, substantial gains in elections. Um, that also came uh, with substantial membership losses for the labor unions. Uh, so the, 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 the union membership uh, is declining quite substantially uh, in the, the 1930, 1931. The, the SPD membership is more stable. Uh, so from the union's perspective, uh, the, 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 there's need uh, to, to change strategy. And in that situation, uh, the, the unions uh, endorse what is known as the uh, WTP plan, named after Wojtynski, Tarnow, and Bade, which is essentially a proto-Keynesian uh, public employment plan that, importantly, would be deficit financed and to some extent also by, by the financed by, by the central bank. And the aim of that employment plan uh, is to create a million jobs, meaning it is substantial job market impact. Uh, in early 1932, there's a, a, a major meeting uh, between uh, the SPD and the unions. The SPD is unhappy that the unions are, in a way, uh, trying to develop macroeconomic policy, which the SPD, the, the uh, Parliament's fraction, is regarding as infringement of the of, of what they are doing, meaning it, it, they think of it as questioning the division of labor between unions and, and party. Uh, and at that meeting where most of the SPD parliamentary fraction and the uh, same number of trade union leaders were, uh, the SPD is rejecting that employment plan. Uh, and one of uh, the main people to reject it is Rudolf Hilferding. And he calls that um, uh, the employment plan inflationary and un-Marxist. Now, the irony of that, of course, is that uh, the Nazis pick up that employment plan and for the coming election actually run uh, with uh, a employment, public employment program that essentially copies important part of that program, which from Nazi's point of view is essentially an attempt to, to drive a wedge between the unions and, uh, and the party. Uh, but what is interesting uh, to me is, is sort of the bigger question is, uh, why did the social democratic leaders endorse these very orthodox economic policies? Now that's the time when the SPD was in a coalition and supported Brüning who essentially did orthodox deflationary policies and thereby worsen the crisis. Uh, so more positively put, so admittedly the next sentence is actually not positive, but is the question, why was there no socialist Keynesianism? No? I mean, various uh, countries then experimented more to the left or more to the right with Keynesianism. On the most left side, it, it was the Swedish Democrats, social Democrats, uh, but Overwhelmingly, the Social Democrats in the 1930s did not endorse uh, Keynesian strategies, but were orthodox in terms of economic policy. Uh, 
Uh, and when I say orthodox economic policy, I always mean that combination of, on the one hand, the gold standard, which is a bit sort of more remote for us today, but at that time, uh, of course, was a very important reference point. Uh, and second, austerity, which, of course, uh, remember the euro crisis nowadays is not at all alien to us, but we're very familiar with. Um, so the outline of the presentation, and I should uh, start with two qualifying comments. The first is, while I really like the Austro-Marxists uh, and can get excited about the period uh, of uh, the Austrian socialist movement at that point, it's actually not my area of research. I'm by background uh, a macroeconomist, post-Keynesian macroeconomist to be precise. Uh, and what so the presentation that you see here uh, is not exactly, is, is not really my field of expertise. It's just something that is too interesting to not think a little bit about it and, and write about it. Um, so what is it that I will be doing in the next uh, half hour or so? Uh, first comes the big hero of my story, and that is Von Vladimir Wojtynski, who is the main author behind the, the VTB plan. Then come a few words on the VTB plan itself. Uh, and then I look at the other side, uh, and that is Rudolf Hilferding. Uh, and as you'll see, I also have a, a soft spot for Hilferding. Uh, it, I mean, it's a fascinating story. I, I mentioned that this is arguably the leading Marxist economic thinker of the time. And he becomes finance minister if admittedly only briefly, essentially at the onset of, of the, the Great Depression. Uh, and then sort of from my perspective, the big disaster ends up uh, uh, supporting Brüning. So we'll think a little bit about why Hilferding uh, rejects uh, the, the WTP plan. Uh, I'll then bring in uh, Sherry Berman, uh, who has uh, a study, a comparative study on German and Swedish social democracy. And she essentially is making the argument in modern social sciences called an ideational argument that it's uh, the, the set of ideas uh, with, uh, where German and Swedish social democrats differ. And essentially she dumps it on Marxist theory. Uh, that's the, the, the reason why the, the Germans were, the German social democrats were so orthodox. Uh, and I, it, to some extent, the, what I'm presenting is a bit of a reply to her, but I admit I don't have fully streamlined focus for the paper yet. So I go with her part of the way, and that is essentially that Marxist economic theory in the time of the Great Depression was not a particularly helpful guide for European, uh, for German social democrats, and indeed were part of uh, the, the reason certainly by Hilferding uh, uh, endorsed uh, orthodox policy. But I'm not buying the whole story of what she's doing. And so I'll bring in a second hero. That's Adolf Sturmthai. Adolf Sturmthai, it, I, I, don't think I've seen him listed as an Austro-Marxist, but he's effectively a second generation Austro-Marxist. Uh, and he has a wonderful little book called The Tragedy of European Labour. And that I'm essentially using as a, as a reply to Sherry Berman, where I agree with the first part of her argument that the Marxists uh, did have a problem uh, with uh, demand management policies. Uh, but that, that's the main reason why the Swedish and the German Social Democrats uh, differ, I reject following Sturmthal, and I substantiate it by looking at the British case, because funny enough, you have all the very similar debates that the German uh, Social Democrats had to what the Brits had, and in the case of the Brits, it was Ramsey MacDonald, certainly no Marxist, uh, who essentially endorsed uh, the, the same issue. And so I'll then wrap up with the question, why was there no socialist Keynesianism? But ultimately, I'm really insisting on the question. I don't have a very strong answer uh, uh, on the question, as, as you'll find out. So let's meet my hero, 
Uh, this is Vladimir Wetinsky, a fascinating uh, creature, uh, in particular once you read his, his autobiography. So Wetinsky is a Russian Jew, uh, uh, grown up, uh, born and growing up uh, in Petrograd, uh, and uh, is a socialist student activist, a student leader uh, during the 1905-06 uh, revolution and uh, becomes involved with the Petrograd Soviet and becomes the leader of the Petrograd Soviet of the unemployed, which uh, until not too long ago, I wasn't aware that it existed, but apparently it did exist. And Wojtynski is developing uh, a public employment program, uh, in, uh, so to speak, commissioned for the Petrograd Soviet. Now, as the uh, dead revolution didn't last very long, this unemployment program never came to fruition, uh, but it's fascinating because what you see here is essentially the first incarnation of the proto-Keynesianism at a time when Wojtynski, who later became a Menshevist, uh, actually was working with the, uh, with the Bolsheviks and uh, uh, Lenin himself, it seems, uh, uh, tried to convince him to, to come uh, to Switzerland to exile. But Wojtynski, decided to stay in Russia, which meant that he spent the next 10 years in prison and in uh, exile in Siberia, survived that, and was released in spring 1917, as uh, pain, I think literally tens of thousands of other political prisoners at the time. He goes back uh, to Petrograd and works for the Petrograd Soviet. Now that is in spring 1917, so the Petrograd Soviet at this point is actually the Mensheviks, not yet the, the, the Bolsheviks. Uh, he does become associated with the Mensheviks uh, after the October Revolution. Uh, he uh, has to flee and he goes to Georgia, which uh, for two years or so is an independent socialist but Menshevik dominated state. And he uh, is starting to work for what wants to become the diplomatic service uh, of Georgia. So he's sent to Italy uh, to represent Georgia. Uh, there, our friend has only two problems. That is A, the Bolsheviks take over Georgia and B, Mussolini uh, uh, be, uh, takes over Italy. So he has to flee again. Uh, he goes first, I think, to Paris, uh, but then to Germany, eventually starts working there for the trade unions uh, and uh, 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 eventually develops the uh, WTB plan. Um, he uh, is very aware uh, that uh, the Nazis would not necessarily like a Jewish Russian socialist uh, who's the leading uh, trade union economist. So he gets out uh, just in time to Switzerland where he briefly works for what will become the ILO and uh, develops a uh, employment program for them. Uh, it, however, when it comes to the question on whether he could get a permanent job at the ILO, it turns out uh, that the Soviet Union is vetoing that because such an inter-revolutionary shouldn't be getting a job at the ILO. So he moves on to the US where he's working for the Bureau of Labor Statistics and with the Roosevelt administration. Now here the heroic part of the story ends because at the end of his life he becomes a cold warrior as a Menshevik, of course, is not exactly uh, endeared to the, to the Bolsheviks, uh, but uh, it becomes a bit worse. He uh, ends up uh, giving uh, speeches in East Asia and in Latin America, praising the benefits of liberal American capitalism, which I'm sure whether it's Korea or Brazil or Argentina uh, went down very well. Uh, but a, a fascinating uh, story. And I, I think the gentleman should have a bigger press than he does. So what was the uh, WTB plan? It was a proto-Keynesian employment program, uh, deficit financed initially, Wojtynski wanted and uh, essentially an international credit bank program. Uh, but as it was becoming clearer that uh, the, 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 there's no international credit forthcoming, uh, the, 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 he designed the program to a essentially deficit financed and uh, part of the deficit finance would be financed by uh, the central bank. Now, it goes without saying that the central bank uh, under Schacht would not be a great friend of, of such an idea. Um, 
so this is proto-Keynesianism in the sense that we are in the year 1930, 1930, uh, 31, 32, meaning we are well before uh, the general theory. Uh, Wojtynski was following and also had a, a, a later exchange with Keynes, but that was before uh, you, the term Keynesianism was established. Yeah? So it, it literally was a, a proto-Keynesianism. In the thin literature on the predecessors of Keynesianism, uh, Wojtynski and the WTB plan are uh, cited. Now, the German trade unions in 1931 endorsed it, which is non trivial. The German trade unions up to 1930 essentially had either abstained from macroeconomic policy or effectively. Uh, uh, supported austerity and deflation. Now, the specific German background, of course, is the period of hyperinflation after the First World War and the attempt to uh, re-establish a stable currency via various mixes of uh, foreign credit and trying to get onto the gold again, to, to join the gold standard. And the unions had supported that, and in particular, uh, uh, were averse to inflation because the hyperinflation, of course, eroded the purchasing power, or real wages, as we would call it nowadays. Uh, and so the, the, the German Social Democrats, as well, the unions for a long time were very inflation allergic, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but under the pressures of the early 30s, uh, the, the rising unemployment, the need for something to happen, but also uh, the fact that they were losing members both to the Nazis and to the communists, uh, they changed and eventually they, they endorsed uh, the, 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 the WTV plan. Uh, Rudolf Hilferding, who had been twice finance minister, uh, was uh, the, the leading voice and the economics expert uh, in the SPD Parlamentsfraktion. And he was the, the spearhead uh, to lead the rejection of that plan and essentially because it would be inflationary and because you can't fix the, the, the deep problems uh, of capitalism by means uh, of public spending. Um, the SPD then grudgingly uh, and as a matter of fact, quite deeply divided. Uh, there were other parts of the SPD, in particular the Reichsbanner, the, the uh, paramilitary wing of the SPD uh, and, and other parts of the, uh, of the party that uh, were critical of the, of the policy uh, that the SPD was, was pursuing. Uh, but it's the Nazis that uh, most effectively used that program uh, for, their, for their propaganda uh, and uh, in a quite uh, open attempt to, to divide the, the union and the party. So what did uh, Hilferding say at that key meeting? Uh, that quotation here, I should say, is from Wojtynski's autobiography, uh, but it seems to be confirmed by the historians, in particular by Wales, who was a close collaborator of, of Hilferding. Uh, and Hilferding there says that Coleman and Wojtynski are questioning the very foundations of our program, Marx's theory of labor value. Uh, and then it goes on, but in the end he says, if Coleman and Wojtyski think they can mitigate a depression by public works, they are merely showing that they are not Marxists. Now, part of that presumably is that Hilverding using his authority, because he's sort of the successor of, of Kautsky as the main theoretician of, of the SPD, uh, uh, in a way, use his theoretical authority to, uh, to say that we can't do that, that's un-Marxist. Uh, but I think he actually believed that that was uh, against Marxist theory and against uh, the labor theory of value. Uh, so this is Rudolf Hilferding, uh, and he is also a fascinating character. Uh, I mean, part of that has already been said in the previous discussion. Uh, he was part of the Austro-Marxist group. He actually studied Medicine, uh, he wrote, for my context, uh, more importantly, the Das Finanzkapital, which uh, again is a fascinating book. And as a post Keynesian myself, I'm mostly fascinated by his monetary theory there. In particular, he develops an argument 
uh, that uh, that we nowadays would call he develops a theory of endogenous money. Right? In in his story, uh, the bills of exchange uh, uh, ensure that the, the the capitalist system has the money supply, the credit that it needs, uh, and he squares that. Now nowadays, endogenous money theory is more about bank credit, but the, the core argument is similar. But if, Hilverding squares that with a more orthodox Marxist reading of the labor theory of value and uh, commodity money and gold as the basis in saying that you still need uh, gold for the international transactions. Uh, so in a way, gold is the, the international money, but the domestic money is, is a endogenously created uh, bank money, if you want. Uh, Hilverding goes to Germany, becomes one of the intellectual leaders of the SPD. He actually joins the USPD, is with, by the way, uh, Bernstein uh, voting against, uh, at least after, uh, I think, 1916, against the, the war credits, uh, and uh, is among, when the USPD is breaking up, uh, among those who join uh, the, the, the SPD. Uh, and he becomes uh, twice finance minister uh, for the SPD, once, but both times for uh, about a year or a few months, once in 23 and once in uh, 28, 29. Uh, and uh, the 29 occasion is uh, particularly interesting uh, because the, 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 the reason he has to resign is uh, around the unemployment benefits. Uh, as uh, economic conditions worsen, uh, the, the, the question is how a uh, balanced budget uh, can be maintained or how budget deficits can be minimized and thus there's pressure to reduce unemployment benefits. And that creates big tensions uh, between the unions and the SPD. Uh, and uh, Schacht, then Reichsbank, uh, President uses that to effectively undermine Hilferding, and Hilferding eventually has to resign. Uh, Hilferding does um, uh, uh, analyze the, the crisis from early on, both in 28, but also in the early 30s, as one where you need deflation to fix the crisis. You need a deflation where prices are falling faster than wages. He didn't necessarily want real wage cut, uh, but he did want deflation and he did not see inflation uh, is coming out. And he also effectively uh, supported the gold standard. Uh, he did after the pressure from the left and uh, wing of the party and the unions increased uh, sort of, uh, push again for a plan of nationalization of key industries to delineate uh, the, his policies from uh, the, the orthodox policies. But at that time, different from, from after the First World War, uh, I, I can't quite see that as a very realistic policy proposal. Now, I realize that my time management is a bit of a disaster because I think I've only five minutes left, but I have a lot of slides left. Um, what do I want to tell you about the labor theory of value? I, I guess what I mostly want to get at here is that in Hilverding's reading of the labor theory of value and his monetary analysis, there is a sort of strong step away and much more theoretization than in Marx of uh, if you want credit money or credit generating money. Um, and that, of course, potentially undermines the labor theory value. But the, the, the trick uh, with which Hilverding tames that and, and, and uh, reconciles it with the labor theory value is that he says, well, the, the, the central banks still need gold reserves. And in the international transactions, you need to bake your currency with gold. So in other words, he is uh, giving up on, uh, on domestic commodity money, uh, but internationally gold and commodity money uh, are, are still there. That actually was this slide. Yeah, then a few words on Sherry Berman, 
Uh, she's having this study on the German versus Swedish social democrats, the Swedish social democrats being the main exception uh, in, in European labor movements in that they actually proposed uh, and eventually implemented uh, Keynesian employment programs. They had a bit of good luck with the timing, but they, in the government, very substantially brought down uh, uh, unemployment in, in the course of the 1930s. Um, and I will argue against Behrman's uh, argue, uh, interpretation that it's really mostly ideational factors, uh, uh, i.e. the adherence to an orthodox Marxist theory, uh, why German social democracy was not uh, being more Keynesian, or not more open or experimental in how to use uh, the state. Now come a few slides on Marxist crisis theory that I also have to condense brutally. Uh, Franz Naftali was a close collaborator of Hilferding and uh, was also a co-author of the, the famous early 20s study on the, on the socialization proposals of the German social democrats. Uh, and he explicitly writes that he doesn't believe uh, that we can do very much nor anything very decisive from the point of view of economic policy to overcome the crisis until it has run its course. So what you have here essentially is a statement uh, with a more or less Marxist base that essentially capitalism needs periodic crisis is an internal cleansing mechanism. And thus, you can't interfere too much. You can either let it run its course, or you can try to replace uh, capitalism if the crisis gets too bad. But it, there, there's not really a vision of how you can manage it. And specifically, he says that if we tend towards a policy of controlling the business cycle, uh, corrective measures must not be taken in the time of the crisis, because we need that for self-cleansing but during the period of prosperity. So in other words, it, it's the very opposite of the Keynesian approach. That says that in the crisis, you come in and, and take over. He says that in the boom, you, you have the Levi uh, to do socialist things. Uh, that's a quotation from Hilferding where he uh, argues strongly against the use of inflationary uh, policies. Uh, he says uh, international inflation is pointless economically uh, impossible, harmful, but also politically unrealistic. That in part refers to the earlier proposals by Wojtynski where there were international credit involved. But he also explicitly says the use of gold in order to restore the disturbed international balance of payments is the way to solve the tremendous credit crisis as quickly as possible. So in other words, get back to the gold standard. Yeah? And in order to do that, of course, you need austerity because that's what, what the market wants. Yeah? Uh, so. What I want to illustrate here is how, while grounded in Marxist theory, Hilferding in that crisis quite explicitly endorses orthodox policies. Now, the SPD in that time did use various underconsumptionist arguments. I'm highlighting that because on the Marxist side, underconsumptionism is often sort of portrayed as the closest that the Marxists have to, to Keynesian uh, the demand theories. The, the SPD did use that in propaganda, but didn't uh, develop consistent economic policies around it. In particular, the, the SPD was always clear that it wanted to avoid inflationary policies. But of course, if you're a, a serious underconsumption is you want to push for higher wages in the, in the crisis, and that, of course, would be inflationary unless you very strongly believe that the prices are fixed. Um, I then also have a little bit to say on Otto Bauer, but looking at the time, I see. What is it that I want to say about Otto Bauer? That refers to the Zwischen zwei Weltkriegen. It, it, essentially, rereading that book with a, a sort of an open eye for what he says about Keynesianism, it's fascinating that he is essentially discussing Keynesian policies or public employment program through the lens of Hitler and Nazi Germany. So. Uh, when the state uh, is doing public employment, uh, that's essentially uh, 
uh, a work fair program, not a proper, proper employment program. And it's essentially doing it in the power interests of the state and essentially preparing uh, uh, the, the, the military. So the industrial reserve army becomes the military reserve army. Uh, now, Bauer was writing uh, in 1936, before the fully Keynesian turn of Roosevelt and the, what is sometimes called the Second New Deal. But it's clear that he also analyzes the New Deal essentially uh, as a variation of that and also refers to it as neo mercantilism. So in other words, for Otto Bauer, that public employment policy is not a, an interesting option for the social democrats. Yeah? So again, I want to illustrate that uh, there, there's something in what these very smart people are doing that leads them to very orthodox policies in the crisis. Then comes my second hero, Adolf Sturmthal. Uh, that book is here just because it has a picture of his on the cover page. Uh, it's also fascinating because it was written in the 1960s and starts with a passionate defense uh, of Fritz Adler and his uh, assassination of the Austrian war minister. Uh, uh, Sturmthal had worked closely uh, with uh, Fritz Adler. Uh, but it's the uh, tragedy of European labor that I'm uh, uh, interested in, because Sturmthal essentially uh, frames the problem much along the ways uh, that I would, would think of it, and that is in very Keynesian terms. Uh, Sturmthal says there is a huge tension in what European labor uh, has done uh, in that period, in that on the one hand, you have the labor unions who push for higher wages, push for a welfare state, and you have uh, the, the socialist parties, which pretend to have the grand theory that differs actually a lot across countries. Sturmdahl had worked in the Socialist International with Fritz Adler, and does, uh, you, you feel that he knows a lot about the internal politics of those different labor parties. And he observes that essentially, Labour parties with quite different ideological backgrounds endorse uh, uh, austerity, and the, the 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 main exception being uh, the, the 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 Swedish uh, socialists. Um, and he says uh, the full strength of labour organisation was turned against the efforts of the employers to recoup on wages and salaries, uh, despite continued profit reductions. Uh, and then there's a similar argument for uh, they pushed against cutting unemployment benefits. Uh, and Stundel says, while at the same time not offering uh, an economic program that would ensure uh, economic growth. Uh, and he says, at that point, pushing for higher wages is pointless because actually the firms don't have the profits to do that. So in other words, he says, at that point, you need to go after macroeconomic policy. Simply put, at that point, you need Keynesian policy. You get you have to get off the gold standard, uh, and you need public employment program. Otherwise, the 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 sort of the pushing for higher wages isn't very meaningful. Um, and uh, then comes a uh, second episode uh, from Great Britain, which I mainly pushing because Ramsay MacDonald was certainly no Marxist. And he essentially and his uh, finance minister Snowden found himself in the very same dilemma uh, that uh, Hilferding had found himself in 1928. So they want to have a balanced budget. Uh, you have an economic crisis. Uh, so there's a, a pressure to reduce uh, unemployment benefits. But unemployment benefits are the big achievement of the social democrats in the period. And the social democrats go wild, uh, sorry, the, the unions go berserk of it. And in the case of Britain, that actually led to the split of the Labour Party. Reigns and McDonald's quits the Labour Party, hopes that the majority of MPs will follow him. They don't, um, which leads to a bad uh, election defeat for the Labour Party, that division. Uh, and uh, however, ironically, a year later, Britain has to go off the Labour standards. Uh, sorry, the, the, not the labor standard, the gold standard, of course. Uh, and it has to go off the gold standard because of the Inver Gordon mutiny. So in other words, uh, parts of the British Navy go on strike, which of course is illegal if you're in the Navy. Uh, 
uh, for higher wages. And that is what triggers uh, the markets to uh, essentially force uh, Britain out of uh, the gold standard. So, uh, and, uh, apologies, that's the, the last slide. Uh, so uh, I'm agreeing with Sturmtai that it's not so much ideational, despite the fact that Marxist theory was uh, particularly unhelpful in that period, uh, but it's a, a, a structural division of labor between the labor unions and the party, uh, and in a way, a, a lack of consistent strategy on how you can create a macroeconomic environment in which those uh, labor union uh, demands are meaningful and realistic, and that requires periodic, uh, uh, at least Keynesian policies. Uh, in Europe, only the Swedes uh, pursued socialist uh, Keynesian policies, if you want. But otherwise, Keynes essentially was left to the liberals and, of course, in its own way to, uh, to, to the Nazis. There's an interesting question on whether Keynes was a socialist or liberal. Uh, the traditional view uh, is that he's a liberal. Actually, there's, in the last few years, several very interesting pieces that argue that Keynes saw himself uh, as a socialist, as a non-Marxist socialist, but a socialist nonetheless. But what I really have in mind when I say a socialist Keynesianism is building on Wojtynski or in Michael Kaletsky as a starting point for using Keynesian policies as part of a broader social democratic policy package that aims at a medium term uh, social transformation. Yeah, but with that, I shut up and apologize for my time management. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting contribution. Uh, you really have prepared uh, so much that we uh, could learn and uh, it would take uh, at least two hours uh, to, to uh, process all that. And I am very uh, looking forward to your article in which uh, all this uh, will be presented. Um, uh, in, a, in a more extensive uh, manner. Uh, so I would uh, now open the floor for uh, questions and comments. So, uh, 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 please, uh, Michael. Okay, thank you very much uh, for interesting presentation and a very clear argument. Uh, I would like to make uh, three remarks, which are also partly at odds with what you have said or try to argue against you. First, uh, that, that's just historical fact. Otto Bauer did endorse in 1933 a public employment uh, program of the uh, Austrian uh, trade unions, the famous program that was meant to create 200,000 jobs although he had a lot of reservations, uh, very similar to uh, Hilferdings, he was afraid of the inflationary uh, consequences. And that has a certain logic in, in, in the uh, Marxist thought. Um, he was afraid of, uh, well, the, the uh, consequences this would have, and remember, this was after 1931. So the experience of a complete breakdown of the international credit system, uh, which was unheard of in this, this dimensions. So uh, the um, argument by Hilferding, I think, or the, I'm not sure, I always had my doubts about this uh, again and again reproduced uh, quote uh, that he uses being, well, he's not a real Marxist as an argument. He very seldom did. Uh, this is a little bit unique. So it's not really his style of argument. But anyway, let's, let's take that for granted. Uh, I think he had a, a, a lot of good reasons for his reservations. And certainly the one was his first stint as a minister of finance was at the height of the hyperinflation of, uh, in Germany. 
it did a relatively good job always, although never get, got credit for that. Uh, but he knew what he was talking about and he knew what he was afraid of. Uh, he had, uh, as Bauer, the experience of the credit crisis. He had even more the experience in uh, 1928, 29, when he tried uh, all kinds of tricks to get international loans and was always uh, opposed and thwarted by the central bank under Hjalmar Schacht. So it is quite probably, well, acceptable if he says, well, the, the central bank will not accept it and our uh, uh, foreign creditors in particular in the US also, they will not give us the money as we need it. Well, the inner Marxist argument of course has a certain logic. If you think the crisis is the result of an over accumulation of capital and the only solution to a crisis within the framework of capitalism is a massive devaluation of capital. Uh, it is logical to say, well, if we are doing that and investing heavily uh, on, on a large scale, so creating uh, a push of uh, effective demand, we will actually prolong the crisis and he will, we will just uh, uh, um, prevent that what is necessary, the, the uh, devaluation of capital on a large scale. That is to a certain degree also what happened in the, in the last great financial crisis. So the saving of the banks means, uh, well, we have stopped the process of bank bankruptcies, of uh, devaluation of fictitious capital to a certain degree. And so we still are stuck with the problem. And my, my third remark is quite simple uh, with respect to Hilferding's uh, monetary theory or assessment of the international monetary order on the international level we still have uh, gold commodity money on the national level it is completely different we are dealing with credit money or uh, bank money uh, and both are in a fragile combination but up to 1971, so 72, 75, the end, the effective end of the international dollar standard, uh, this argument still was more or less sound. Afterwards, well, it's completely different, but after that, so after from the uh, 1970s onwards, we again have a big debate, ongoing debate until this very moment, uh, about the value of money. What is the value of money? Where does it come from? And there is no clear solution to that. So the, the present situation in my, or the situation since in the early 1970s is quite different from all the previous monetary regimes what we know in the history of uh, modern capitalism, uh, which of course does not mean that we can uh, understand the present situation by simply repeating uh, uh, Hilferding's ideas, uh, which date from uh, before World War I. Okay, that, that was it, three, three remarks. Uh, shall I reply or do we collect questions? Yes, please. yes. Can do what, what you like. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Uh, if you can say, uh, I have to admit, I did actually not look closely at, at power and employment. I literally only looked at the uh, at, at Zwischen den Weltkriegen and what you wrote there about the mm. crisis. So if you can send me uh, some reference to the, uh, if you have any specific reference in mind to that employment program, yes, I would he, be grateful. He did, the, the program did exist and Bauer wrote on it and he defended it. And, uh, also in public meetings, and he tried to convince uh, the, the party leaders that this was uh, eventually the right policy. But he actually made this, uh, in, in well, more or less bold step forward and uh, embraced such a, in, endorsed such a program, yes. Yeah. Yeah. As did other, by the way, other socialists also did in, in other uh, European countries. So there is Switzerland, there's Belgium, there are the Netherlands, they all came up with plans of labor, which are proto Keynesian programs. And the Swedes are just one example of many. So uh, you could say that the, the uh, 
opposition between the orthodox Marxists and the less orthodox, uh, more bold uh, uh, people willing to engage in a macroeconomic policy was, was different in different parts of Europe. Uh, France would be also an example, but okay. Uh, on Hilverding, um, the, the, the point about hyper, the experience of hyperinflation, the, the, there's certainly something to it. No? I mean, the, the German mm. Social Democrats, more than others, were in a way burnt children of the hyperinflation. Uh, but that also means that that blinded them to the problems of the 1930s. Because if you're in a way, and that's what uh, what Brüning did, if you enter the the Great Depression with uh, sort of the, the mindset of how to fight inflation, <laughs> that is a recipe for disaster. So. It, it, mm. I think that's an explanation, but that the, the, of why he did it, but that doesn't make it. Uh, that, that that's no excuse. What I what is what it wasn't I mean. meant as an excuse. Um, in terms um, of the overaccumulation, but also the gold standard, I think I'm quite far away from your assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, the the overaccumulation. I'm fully with you that that's the argument that Hilferding and others, also Otto Bauer, to some extent, had in mind that ultimately, if you do public policy, you're extending the crisis. Yeah? The, the Keynesian uh, big argument is actually no, that that's the way out of the crisis. Yeah? Uh, the, the crisis is exactly that there isn't enough demand. Uh, and that's what you have. I mean, the, the issue on a fundamental level, if, if you're consumerist enough to, we think more consumption good is good for us, uh, or people like that, then there fundamentally can't be a problem of all accumulation. There can't just be a problem that either the wrong people have the money, you produce the wrong stuff, or overall, there just isn't enough demand. And, and that's the, the, the Keynesian argument. The savings the bank, analogy I think is off. A, savings the bank is not a Keynesian policy. Keynesian policy is policy that leads to full employment. What we have had in reaction to the global financial crisis was a Keynesianism of the bankers. So part of the argument that I'm making is in, a lot of Marxist friends of mine are telling me that Keynesians want to save capitalism. I think one should take a much more neutral take on Keynesianism and regard it as a macroeconomic theory that offers you a specific set of tools for economic policy making. And you can use that for nasty and for socialist purposes. And indeed, that was happened. I mean, whether it's, uh, it's Hitler, whether it's Roosevelt, who had his own muddling through between leftist and the southern US racists. Uh, to the Swedish Social Democrats. You can use those tools for various different purposes. And what we've seen after 2008 is essentially <laughs> Keynesianism for the bankers that they get saved. And after two years, you, you start, after two years of um, employment stabilization, you start cutting back on unemployment benefits. Yeah? That's not Keynesianism. And that may create a prolonged, as if you want, the debt overhang crisis but that is not a valid argument against Keynesianism. Similarly, I think I disagree on what you said about the gold standard. Exposed, of course, it is correct that until uh, the, the late seventies, there was some form of indirect gold standard. But the point is that was a political choice. It, it, it's not in the nature of things. And that, that it would be in the nature of things follows from a commodity theory of value as Ricardo had it, and that in its own way gets reconstructed for the international label by Hilferding. Yeah? So if you're coming from that part, it actually is not unnatural to have gold because Marx in a way for the first hundred pages of, the, of Capital tells you that there has to be a, a general equivalent 
which itself has to be a produced commodity and it happens to be mostly gold or sometimes silver. It has to be a produced commodity. Versus the Keynesian or the statist here might say, actually, no, it doesn't have to be a co produced commodity at all. And in modern economy, isn't. So in other words, it's a policy choice that we had the gold standard. And that's precisely what uh, Ramsey McDonald said when he was told that we are off the gold standard. How can we do that? No one told me that we could do that. Yes, they could do it. They could do it at that point and they could do it in the 1970s. And the, 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 the particular version of Marxist monetary theory that he putting it sort of predispositioned him for such a, a sort of inactive reading of the gold standard. And in general, that's my argument, encouraged a, ultimately a, a lack of means of intervention on side of, of, uh, of the social democrats. Uh, I am sorry that I have to interrupt this uh, very interesting discussion, but we are running short on our time. Unfortunately, and we have uh, another question uh, still uh, to be answered, uh, Walter, uh, please go Yes, ahead. Uh, maybe you um, will find this a little bit provocative because uh, I, I really enjoyed the very um, uh, topical discussion on the economic side of the problem, but I believe as far as Austria is concerned, the problem was political, actually, it, in 1933, um, everything was done. I believe there was no chance to uh, have a turnaround in the in the political um, in the political development. Um, I believe that, and this is the dilemma: uh, if uh, the Social Democratic Party was willing uh, to um, fight for uh, an employment program, growth and employment program, it would have to assume a governmental um, responsibility. And that is what they did not want. And uh, I would go even further. Uh, the problem is not that Bauer maybe did not understand the problem. The problem was that the doctrine of the unity of the party did not allow them to do this. Because even in 1933, in this famous conference in which Otto Bauer gave his dramatic uh, speech, he hinted to the fact uh, that uh, they were stuck between um, the left opposition in the party and uh, the uh, possibility of reacting to the dramatic uh, shift uh, in the political relation of power. And uh, I think, I mean, there is no, no answer now, but uh, I very much like uh, that what you quoted from Sturmtal, uh, that the labor movement was not sufficiently politically minded, meaning was not sufficiently aware of which conditions ought to be created in order to uh, apply a, a different program? Uh, thanks for that. Just for clarification, I, I admit that when I developed the argument, I really had in mind Germany, not Austria. Otto Bauer only came in after you asked me to speak at this conference, so I thought I had to look at, uh, at what, what Bauer wrote. And I admit, I'm also not familiar really with, with the, the Austrian policy debates. It, it is certainly true that uh, in 1933, it, it certainly was too late. It won, the, the, the Social Democrats would have had to think much earlier in, in the course of the 20s about uh, Keynesian policies. The, Barry Sherman, I think, has a point in that there was a deep-rooted ambivalence uh, to the state, what you can use the state, to what extent it's essentially a means of the ruling classes, or to what extent you can instrumentalize it. And in that dilemma, the demand policy, demand management fell off. Yeah? And that, I think, was, uh, was a big problem. Um, I had a second point, but it, it escapes me now. Um, now, I think I just stopped here. <laughs>